Hello there. Welcome to the Saraway channel, wherever you are in the world, and so much love to each and every one of you. How are you doing? I do hope you're doing remarkably well. I'm doing great, thank you very much, and I'm so glad you've joined me for the final part of our story tonight. And basically what we found out is that Adeline has gone to stay in Canmore in Canada, and during the night she hears a screaming going on in the woods, and she discovers a young lady has fallen into a ditch, and she helps get the young lady out of the ditch. But it was a Bigfoot who led her to the ditch because she got completely lost in the woods in the middle of the night, and so she rescued this young lady. So let's continue with our story. It was as if she was reading my mind, because she said, I was running after my dog Tubbs. He rocketed into the trees. He fell into the ditch first, you see. I heard his anguished cries, and then I ran after him and fell into the ditch as well. I had absolutely no idea there was a huge dip in the ground. I never saw it coming. But then I was using my cell phone light at the time, and it was pitiful, let's not kid. Well, it is pretty dark in here, I admitted. It's easy to fall down a ditch, with all the vines growing over the hole, covering it. I'm only glad I heard your screams. Thank God you did. My cell phone got damaged during the fall, she said, pulling out the shattered cell phone from a pocket of her jeans to show me. I couldn't call for help, so I screamed, in the vain hope that someone might actually hear me. I knew that there was a house near the woodgrove, and as I told you, I've got a voice that can carry. I was so hoping someone would hear me, but I wasn't exactly confident that anybody would come to my rescue. And then there you were, like an answer from God. What exactly happened? I asked her. I mean, it's late at night. What were you doing here? I'm sure people in these parts don't make a habit of scrambling around the woods unless they're coon hunting or something. I know it's very late, she admitted. My boyfriend broke up with me this evening. I felt so hopeless, so lost. Everything was all over the place in my mind. I was tossing and turning restlessly in my bed, crying my heart out. I couldn't get to sleep. I really loved him. I couldn't believe he dumped me like that. So I decided to take a drive in the middle of the night. I always find that when I take a drive, when I'm in a bad place, it helps ease my mind. I find it soothes my anxiety, you see. I suppose I can understand that. I also find driving rather soothing. It helps me when I'm feeling low. I do it myself regularly, when I'm in a bad place, I suppose. So I get where you're coming from. I was having a cigarette in the car, I'm afraid. I haven't smoked cigarettes for many months now. I gave up the nasty habit. But after Jason broke up with me last night, I was literally gagging for a cigarette. They help calm my nerves, you see. So I pinched a packet from my father. I parked my car opposite the grove of trees on that sequestered country road through there. I brought little Tubbs along with me for the ride. He's always such great company. He was seated in the front seat next to me. Normally he's reasonably well behaved. But tonight he had other ideas on his mind. I unwound the window to let out the smoke from my cigarette. In a trice, Tubbs saw some rabbits darting across the road, running into the trees. He began to yap excitedly. You know what dogs are like. Before I could stop him, he impulsively jumped out of the car window and ran after those rabbits like a bat out of hell. There was nothing I could do to stop him. He just disappeared into the trees. I had to get out of the car to chase after him because he was gone. I kept calling him. But he willfully ignored me, refusing to come back. That dog can be incorrigible at times, especially when he sees a rabbit. He then conveniently forgets who I am and becomes selectively mute. I just remember thinking that this was going to be one hell of a wild goose chase. I was worrying I wasn't going to get poor little Tubbs back because he gets himself into some sticky situations at times. I was cursing myself for having wound down the window. I was so annoyed that he wasn't coming to me when I called him. So I had to run into the woods. I didn't have much choice in the matter. And then, then, what happened next? 
Well, then I heard this horrible, agonizing whimper. It went right through me. It was the most awful sound. I knew it was Tubbs. I knew he'd got in some terrible trouble of some kind. I thought he was hurt. I thought a wild animal might have grabbed him and was trying to tear him limb from limb. I ran with my heart just booming in my chest straight after him. I guess I didn't really look where I was going. The next thing I knew, I was flung right off my feet into the ditch. To my surprise and great relief, I found Tubbs had also met the same fate as I did. In fact, when I ended up at the bottom of the pit, or the ditch, whatever you want to call it, I actually burst out laughing for a while, even though I was in agonizing pain, because I was covered with the warm welcome kisses from Tubbs's tongue. It was such a relief to see he was all right. Oh, goodness gracious me, that is some story. I can't believe you both fell down the same ditch. It's incredible. Well, as you can imagine, Tubbs was thrilled to see me. I think he forgot about the rabbits he was chasing. But my ankle was in agony, and so was his back leg. I screamed for help, especially when I discovered my cell phone had broken and I couldn't call anyone for help. I didn't know how long I would be stuck down here until you came along to save the day, or the night, if you like. Goodness gracious me, I've never had such a shock in all my life. It was one hell of a shock to be flung down this ditch, let me tell you. I'm sorry that such a horrible thing had to happen to you, I said. That naughty dog of yours led you straight to the ditch, but at least you're all right, and at the end of the day, that's all that matters. Thanks to you. My name is Fee, by the way, and you are... Adeline. That's a nice name. Adeline. I like it. I mean, can you believe it? said Fee, holding her French bulldog tightly in her arms, close to her chest, and looking down at the ditch from which she'd fallen. It was my birthday today. Jason broke up with me on my birthday. Now tell me, who does that? Who does that? Maybe he was just too tight to buy you a present, I teased. Happy birthday, by the way. I'm quite sure this is one you won't forget in a hurry, as falling down a ditch is not an experience that you're easily going to forget. Well, it is true, Jason did not buy me a present. But he's not usually mean with his money. He did buy me a bouquet of flowers, and then he took me out to dinner earlier in the evening, as I told you. Then he said he had something important to tell me. I thought, I thought... You thought what? I asked. I thought he was going to tell me he loved me, that he couldn't imagine his life without me. I thought maybe he was on the verge of proposing to me. How stupid can I be? I thought he was going to pop the question. Can you believe I was such a mug? We've been together for over four years now, and I really believed our relationship was going swimmingly. And then he said those words, said Fee. Oh, I can't bear to even think about what he said to me. It was so humiliating said Fee, looking woeful, tears trailing down her cheeks, which she wiped away with the back of her hands. What did he say, Fee? He said, I'm sure you agree it is not working out between us, Fee. I think we should call it quits on our relationship, don't you? I never saw this coming. I thought he was pulling my leg at the time, I really did, having a joke at my expense. But he was being deadly serious. I was so grievously hurt. I got up in the middle of the meal and walked out of the restaurant in floods of tears. Everybody was staring at me. It was so humiliating, I just wanted the ground to swallow me whole. But can you believe it? He was so not a gentleman. He didn't even bother to come after me. Can you believe that? Well, he sounds like an awful person, I said. Well, I took an Uber taxi home. I didn't want that man driving me back from the restaurant. I wanted nothing more to do with him. When I got home, I got all these apologetic texts from him on my cell phone, saying he was sorry, but it was for the best that we didn't see each other again. And he was sorry things had ended up on such a sour note between us. But he hoped at some point that we could be friends again. You know the sort of thing. Blah, blah, blah. I'm so sorry. That's tough, I said. You're telling me it's tough. I hate him. I hate him for this. I really hate him. Well, you know what? I think you're well rid of him, Fee. As you say, dumping you on your birthday was a callous thing to do. 
I don't think he deserves you. Let me walk you straight back to your car. You know where you parked it, don't you? Fee nodded. It's down the path through the trees. I really would appreciate your company, Adeline, if you don't mind. I don't have any light on me. You have no idea how grateful I am to you for all your help. You're not from around here, are you? No, I'm currently living in New York, would you believe? Are you being serious? I'm afraid so. What do you think of Canmore? Do you like it here? I think it's very beautiful. The views are amazing. I love the mountains. It sure is beautiful. I'm staying with the Bentleys. You don't know them, do you? This grove of trees surrounds their property. The Bentleys, said Fee, looking at me through narrowing eyes. I know Luca Bentley. Everybody knows Luca. He's so handsome. I've met his sister a couple of times. Everybody around here likes the Bentleys. My mother's good friends with Viola Bentley. They belong to the same book club, I believe. Wow, it's a small world, I said. Luca's been very good to me, shown me around Canmore. We've got a bit of a connection, I think. I really like him. Let me tell you, Luca's a catch, said Fee. She chuckled. Whoever snags him is one lucky woman. The trouble is he's a very shy person. It's very difficult to communicate with someone that's so reticent like that, if you know what I mean. I sat happily with Fee in her car for a long while, and we chatted about so many things. She then drove me back to the cottage on the Bentley's property, so I didn't have to navigate my way precariously through the woods again. But that was a night that I would not forget in a hurry, as my outlandish encounter with the Bigfoot male was not far from my mind. I felt thrilled to have met the creature, because I knew what I experienced was terribly special. The following morning, Luca walked with me through the grove of trees that I had explored the previous night. I decided to tell him what had happened to me. I told him about Fee's screams and how I had got up in the middle of the night to follow those screams to find out what the source of the problem was. Luca looked at me through confounded, steely eyes. Why would you do a thing like that, Adeline? Do what? I asked. Go out in the middle of the night on your own after you heard a strange scream in the woods. You don't even know the woods on this property. If you were worried about an unsettling noise, at the very least you should have given me a call. We are your hosts here while you're staying in Canmore, and we would have felt responsible if something untoward were to happen to you. I didn't want to wake you up, Luca, nor did I want to wake up your mother Viola. It was very late. I heard a woman screams very clearly. I knew I needed to help her. Luca shook his head. You know, Adeline, that was not a wise thing to do, if you don't mind my saying so. You're brave, I'll give you that, but definitely very foolish. I've lived on this property all my life, Adeline. I've heard strange things coming from those woods at night, things I was never able to explain, but never in a million months of Sundays. Would I ever investigate what was going on in there? Believe it or not, some of those screams gave me the chills when I was a boy. I kept well away from those strange noises. I didn't want anything to do with the woods at night. And then you, you, a girl who comes from New York, just literally comes and stays on our property and doesn't even bat an eyelid about running into the woods after a strange screaming sound. You surprise me. You really do. Well, it's a good job I did investigate what was going on in the woods, Luca. Or otherwise, poor Fee and her French bulldog could have been stuck down there all night in that ditch. So thank goodness I was able to help her out. I still don't know how I did it. I'm not exactly strong. It was tough pulling her out. She kept sliding down the ditch. Anyway, Fee strained her ankle really badly. And her dog, I think, twisted the back of his leg. The poor thing was in terrible pain, but luckily he didn't run off again. I think he was in shock. You must be talking about Fee McGregor. She lives in these parts. A very nice girl she is. I've known her for many years. If anyone was going to end up down a ditch with a French bulldog, it could only be Fee McGregor. The girl is notorious for getting herself into heaps of trouble. And that French bulldog of hers, Tubbs, is one big bundle of mischief. He's fixated over rabbits, I believe. 
He sees a rabbit and shoots off after it like a bullet. One time he went missing for two whole days. Everybody in town was looking for the dog. He'd fallen down an old drain after chasing after a rabbit. But he didn't learn from his mistakes. Absolutely not. He hasn't lost his interest in rabbits one little bit. Don't be mean, Luca. I mean, Tubbs is a cute little dog. And you can't blame him for what happened last night. Well, maybe you can. I suppose he is indirectly responsible for Fee ending up down a ditch. Well, they're both as bad as each other, aren't they? said Luca, chuckling. I mean, honestly, those two, dog and owner, are exactly alike if you ask me. I just feel so sorry for Fee. I mean, she had the most awful night last night. It was her birthday, you know. Her boyfriend took her out for an evening meal to celebrate. To a fancy restaurant, I believe it was. And then she thought he'd propose to her. But he didn't do any of that. You're joking, right? laughed Luca. Jason Crawley is a loser. He'd never commit to anyone, let alone propose to them. That man would never ask anyone to marry him. The only thing Jason Crawley cares about is Jason Crawley. I know because I was at school with him. In truth, I was surprised that someone as lovely as Fee would be remotely interested in the man. If Jason married anyone, he'd marry himself. He's one of those men that loves to study his own reflection in the mirror. He thinks he's all that, he really does. For the life of me, I don't understand why women find him so irresistibly attractive. Well, if you must know, he didn't propose to Fee last night, as she'd hoped. Instead, he broke up with her on her birthday. Now, can you believe that? He told her that things were not working out in their relationship. I believe they've been together now for four whole years. I mean, how inconsiderate and selfish do you have to be? to break up with someone on their birthday of all days. Who does that? Luca let out a low whistle. I've got to hand it to Jason Crawley. He certainly knows how to pick his magical moments. Having said that, I once heard a lot of people tend to break up with their partners before Valentine's Day, so that they don't have to buy chocolates or flowers or take their girlfriend out to an expensive restaurant. I'm not sure, of course, that that is the reason for the breakups. But stats do tend to show that before Valentine's Day, lots of relationships come to an abrupt end. I didn't know that. Well, it's true, I believe. Anyway, I imagine Fee must have been upset to have been ditched like that on her birthday. That man is not chivalrous. His attitude towards women stinks. He has a history, of course, of dumping them. So the fact that he's dated Fee for four years should actually go down in the Guinness Book of Records. I don't know what Fee ever saw in him. She deserves so much better. I warned her not to get involved with him. But she never listened to my salient advice. I guess she was too smitten by him to see sense. I agree. The man is a piece of work. I know I've never met Jason Crawley. But from what you've said, he sounds like a considerable creep. I just feel so sorry for Fee. I really like her, you know. She's so broken up about this. I genuinely think she believed that she would marry Jason one day. So I guess in a way her dreams have been shattered. She's well rid of him if you ask me, said Luca. A girl like Fee can do so much better than Jason Crawley. He shook his head sorrowfully. Why is it that some women are attracted to the most awful men who treat them like the turd on their shoe? And yet they go back again and again for more and more bad treatment. I've never understood it myself. So tell me, Adeline, what on earth was Fee McGregor doing in our woodgrove of all things? Let me guess. It was that French bulldog of hers, wasn't it? Tubbs up to all kinds of trouble again, said Luca, breaking out into a huge grin. How did you know? How did you know it was Tubbs? I just guessed. That dog of hers... He has a bit of a reputation, you know. Well, Fee told me she went home, you know, after she'd been to the restaurant with her boyfriend. She was upset about the breakup with Jason. She tried to get to sleep, but she had a very restless night and got incredibly upset. So that was why she took a drive during the night. 
bringing little tubs along with her for company. She told me she'd given up cigarettes a long time ago, but she pinched some from her father. She was upset, so she had to have a cigarette smoke to calm her down. She found a pretty place to park her car opposite your grove of trees, so she could enjoy a view of the night sky. She says she finds stargazing eases her nerves. It seems to me a lot of things appear to ease Fee's nerves. Like stargazing, smoking cigarettes, going out for drives in the middle of the night, running in the middle of the wood grove when it's very dark. Lots of things appear to be calming that young lady down, and then she ends up in all kinds of trouble as a result. She was upset, Luca. People often turn to things when, you know, when they're upset. I mean, some people might turn to food, others drink, drugs, cigarettes, even exercise. Luca nodded. You make a good point there, Adeline. Perhaps I'm being too hard on Fee. It's true, when I'm upset, I suddenly have a very sweet tooth. Unquenchable cravings, you could say, for anything dripping with nectar. When my mother, Viola, told me that George Charlotta had died, and I realised I was never going to get to meet my mother's father, my grandfather, I was grievously upset about that, as you can imagine. So I went off to the Milky Way, and I had two milkshakes and waffles with maple syrup and ice cream. So I get exactly what you're saying. I think that day all I wanted was to indulge in the sweetest things I could find. I had an insatiable appetite for all things sweet. Well, there you go, then. I prove my point. I guess for Fee, cigarettes and a night drive were her go-to drugs. So that's what she was doing, having a smoke. She opened the car window like you do if you're smoking to release some of the smoke and drop the ash to the ground. She said there were some cute little rabbits darting across the road. As you can imagine, her French bulldog Tubbs began to bark excitedly when he spotted the rabbits. The next thing she knew, Tubbs had jumped out of the window and given the rabbits chase. They ran into the woods, with Tubbs following behind. She scrambled after her dog, who didn't come when she called him. Luca laughed. I might have guessed that that is what happened. I told you that dog of hers is predictable. He's fixated on rabbits. Once he's got a dead rabbit caught up in his jaws, I believe he refuses to let it go. Fee had to struggle with a stick once to pry the dead rabbit out of his mouth. The dog refused to let his trophy go. The rabbit was crawling with maggots. I gather it stank the entire house out. Fee said the tubs had a breath on him that smelt worse than death and decay itself. I laughed at the thought of Tubbs refusing to let go of a stinking dead rabbit infested with maggots. That's hilarious, I chuckled. You've got to admit, Luca, Tubbs is quite the character. That dog's a little comedian. I could almost see him scampering off into the woods with poor Fee McGregor chasing after him, screaming blue murder, saying, Get back here, you naughty dog. I wonder if Tubbs enjoys provoking her, winding her up, so to speak. He certainly doesn't like to listen to her. The worst thing of all is navigating those woods at night, with only a cell phone for company. It's not going to get you very far, with all those burgeoning creepers encroaching across the ground like that. It's hardly any wonder that both dog and owner sustained a nasty fall. But it could have been worse, I suppose. Thankfully, they didn't break any bones. Those woods are suffocatingly close at night, said Luca. You're not going to see much with a cell phone light, let me tell you. I think Fee McGregor was foolish to go after Tubbs. She should have remained at her car and continued to call him. Maybe he'd have come back to her. She shouldn't have gone after him like she did. What are you girls like? You're no better, Adeline, are you? You went in search of those screams in the woods, determined to find answers. And that wasn't exactly a salient thing to do of you. Well, I don't think either of us had much choice, really. Fee certainly didn't. She needed to go after Tubbs as soon as she could. If Fee had stayed at her car, Tubbs might have been stuck in that ditch. And as for me, I knew someone was in serious trouble and they needed my help. I couldn't just leave them in the woods, could I? I suppose you're right. But I still say, Adeline, without sounding like a broken record that I wish you had contacted me and told me what was going on. 
You're asking for trouble running around in the woods in the dead of night, if you can't see the hell where you're going. I can't say I'm remotely surprised that Fee fell down a ditch. As you were saying, it could have been a whole lot worse. I'm just glad it wasn't. You're telling me! I mean, I had a torch with me, and I really struggled to find my way through those trees. It was more than a little intimidating, scrambling around in the darkness, with those roots trespassing across the forest floor, not to mention jutting rocks and pieces of driftwood lying loosely across the ground. Anyway, as Fee was calling after her dog, that was when she heard a whimper. She knew that her dog was in trouble. Her first thought was that a wild animal had attacked Tubbs. So she freaked out, let me tell you. That would have been terrifying for Fee, Luca agreed. Whatever you may say about Tubbs, let me tell you, Fee loves that dog. She told me she was terribly afraid. She increased her running pace. The next thing she knew, she had gone flying down the ditch as well, landing at the bottom of it with a mighty thud. She twisted her ankle really badly. It would seem her cell phone got badly smashed during the fall, so she couldn't call anyone for help. Fee was to discover that Tubbs had fallen down the same ditch, where she found herself, so she was relieved to see he was all right. But I think that Tubbs did something to the back of his leg. He was limping. He couldn't put his weight on his back paw. But she's taking him to the vet, well, this morning. Luckily, your family's guest cottage overlooks the trees. So that was why I heard her cries for help. It was definitely a woman's calls. I knew it wasn't an animal or anything like that. I think after your grandfather died in the flat above my head, and I didn't know a thing about it, I felt so bad that I was unable to help him. So I knew I couldn't ignore those screams in the wood. So I took a fire poker with me from the cottage as a defensive weapon in case someone was being attacked, along with a torch, and I went to see what was going on. But I also forgot to take my cell phone, which was a very stupid thing to do. Well, it is rather hilarious Fee falling down a ditch like that, I have to admit, Luca said. Why don't you show me where this ditch is? Because it sounds like it needs to be filled in. It would be a horrible trap for wild animals and people to fall down during the night. And this isn't the first time that something like this has happened. We walked around in the woodgrove until I reached the location where the ditch had been, as I'd remembered the landmarks reasonably well. I could see some of the burgeoning vines had been pulled away. The ground had been visibly cleared. What's wrong? asked Luca. You've gone as white as a ghost. The ditch was here, I told him. It's been filled in. The vines have been pulled out. I promise you this thing was about eleven foot deep, Luca. I'm not exaggerating. It was here last night. But it's gone. It's not here any more. Even the leaves on top of this loose soil weren't here before. This is insane. Absolutely insane. If I didn't know any better, I would say I dreamed the events of last night. But I assure you, I didn't. If you look at my pyjamas... On the leg area, they're filthy dirty, covered with soil, and I've torn the hems. Are you sure you aren't confused, Adeline? Maybe you saw the ditch somewhere else. This grove is very big, it can be confusing. I promise you, the ditch has been filled in. Can't you see the ground here is loose? The soil is not compacted, which shows that someone has filled it in. I walked over to some loose leaves and pulled them away. Look at this, Luca. Luca stared at the ground incredulously. Those are human footprints. But they can't be. They're far too big to be human. And they're certainly not a bear's. Bears don't have toes. That's because they don't belong to a human, Luca. Nor do they belong to a bear. They belong to a Bigfoot. What are you talking about, Adeline? I missed one part of the story out, Luca. "'because I wasn't sure you'd actually believe me. "'But you can see these footprints are too big to be human, "'so maybe you'll believe the rest of my story.' "'Sorry,' said Luca. "'You're losing me, Adeline. "'What are you saying?' "'I didn't tell you everything that happened last night, Luca, I'm afraid. "'But I actually seriously lost my way in the woods. "'It was very scary. "'Like you were saying, it's so easy to get lost in the woodgrove "'in the middle of the night.' 
with a labyrinth of paths spread out all over the place. I tried to follow the sounds of Fee's desperate cries for help, but they eventually became fainter and fainter on the wind, and I realised I was going in the wrong direction, that I had to retrace my steps, and that was when I got the shock of my life. Someone began to throw a whole pile of pebbles at me. I have never been so afraid when that happened, let me tell you. They what? asked Luca, looking bemused. Someone stopped me in my tracks, Luca. They threw a bunch of pebbles at me. As you can imagine, I was absolutely terrified because I knew someone was there. I felt as if I was being watched. And that, that was when I saw him. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. You saw who? I shook my head in frustration. I didn't know how to describe the Bigfoot to Luca. Well, I saw a dark shadowy silhouette standing there in the trees. It was gargantuan in size. It had a human face and bright yellow eyes. I saw a Bigfoot, Luca. That's what I saw. A Bigfoot. But are you sure you saw a Bigfoot? I'm 1000% sure it was a Bigfoot. I was terrified. I bet you were. Meeting a Bigfoot in the middle of the night, in a grove of trees, has got to be intimidating. I can't imagine what you must have thought. I couldn't move, Luca. I wanted to run away and forget about the woman's crying for help. But you know what? I just froze to the spot. I couldn't move. Can you believe that? When I needed to run away, I was unable to do so. Yes, I can believe that said Luca. Our cat Georgie girl is forever bringing in mice from the barn, you know. Some of them survive, only for one reason, because they refuse to move. Then she loses interest in them, because she likes to chase after anything that moves. Sometimes these mice just freeze, and you know what? That actually saves their lives. Well, that's exactly what happened to me, Luca. I froze to the spot, and then... You're not going to believe this part of my story and I wouldn't blame you if you didn't believe it at all because if you told me the same thing, I would definitely not believe you. But the Bigfoot spoke to me telepathically. What is that supposed to mean, Adeline? Well, I heard words in my head, didn't I? Distinctive words that I couldn't possibly confuse with my own thoughts. It was like an audible voice going right through me. A deep male, raspy voice, actually. Well, that is incredible. I am very impressed. I used to be extremely interested in listening to stories of alien abductions. I wasn't sure, of course, whether I believed in them or not, and the accounts of these so-called people. But I did wonder why anyone would lie about such experiences, when they had more to lose and to gain from such stories. I've always had an open mind in regards to these things, including cryptid creatures like Bigfoot. I certainly believe there is more going on in this world than meets the eye. Some people describe the world as like an oversized onion, with many, many layers, and we're living on one of those layers. There are also many dimensions. They say that there is a hollow earth within our earth, a subterranean area, with very large plant life and healthy growth, where they have their own sun. The people living there are very large and have long lifespans. And things like the grape, a single grape, is like a size of a large apple. I do believe during the Second World War, a man called Admirable Bird flew over Antarctica. That was when he observed the hollow earth for himself. He was invited to see around it. He met the people that lived there. He claimed to have seen a woolly mammoth and those things were supposed to have long since been extinct. So yes, I do believe in extraordinary things that make no sense to us at all. And when it comes to alien abductions, I have learned that people claim to communicate by telepathic means. So it's not absurd to me that the Bigfoot spoke to you telepathically. I believe it. I didn't know any of this about the Hollow Earth and about Admirable Bird. It sounds absolutely fascinating. I'm willing to believe so much now, now that I've encountered a Bigfoot. Because let me tell you, our conversation was telepathic. He was very articulate when he spoke to me.
incredibly intelligent. He told me that there was a woman in trouble who needed my help. He said he couldn't rescue her because he knew his presence would terrify the woman. I think he was aware of the fact that some people would not react favourably in meeting a creature of his sheer size and girth. He told me that I needed to help her instead. He obviously thought I was not going to be freaked out by him, although I was in the beginning, I have to say. Imagine having that kind of awareness of how people are going to react to you. He was very perceptive, that's all I can say. He indicated for me to follow him. I realised at once he was benevolent, that he would never hurt me. I was amazed he was so concerned about Fee's well-being. He really wanted to help her. I forgot about his size and about my fear when I followed him. He then pointed to the ditch, and that was where I discovered Fee. Last night, when I accompanied Fee back to her car, she eventually gave me a lift back to the cottage. I think the Bigfoot returned to the ditch, and I believe he took the initiative to fill it in. He knew it imposed a threat to the safety of people and animals alike that visited the grove, and that if he didn't do something to rectify the situation, it might invariably happen again. It's like he had that protective guardian energy about him, if you know what I mean, Luca. So you really think the Bigfoot filled in the ditch? asked Luca. Yes, I think so. He didn't want a similar accident to reoccur again, because the pit was treacherous. You do believe me, Luca, don't you, that I saw a Bigfoot last night? I promise you I'm not making any of this up. Of course I believe you, said Luca, studying the enormous footprint more closely. There is no way on this earth that any human being has a foot this size. My face was flooded with relief, because Luca believed me, and then something quite incredible happened that I never saw coming. I put my fingers on my lips and beckoned for Luca to be very quiet, as we could hear someone whistling a tune in the grove. I knew it had to be the Bigfoot. Luca looked astounded. You think it's him? he whispered. The Bigfoot you saw last night? You think he might be whistling that tune? I do. Be quiet. I don't want to scare him away. I saw him last night because he needed my help. But I don't get the impression he's in the habit of showing himself to people. But you do want to see him, don't you? Of course I want to see him, said Luca. Then we need to be very, very quiet, I insisted. The merry whistling continued. Luca, who had a great perception of sound, guided me through the woods towards it. That was when we saw the Bigfoot. We thought we were so hidden from view, but we couldn't have been more wrong about that, for the Bigfoot stopped whistling at once and trotted over to where we were hiding. And when he saw us cowering in the undergrowth, I heard him say in my head, Oh, it's you again. Have a very good day. He nodded at us and simply glided away, and Luca grabbed my hand and hooted. Did you see that? Goodness gracious me. I can't believe it. We've just seen a Bigfoot. It was during my stay with Viola and directly after George Charlotta's funeral that Luca and I became inseparable. I never went back to my life in New York, only to retrieve a few things from my flat. One year later, Luca and I were married and Fee McGregor was the matron of honour at my wedding. She and I have become the very best of friends. I thank George Charlotta for bringing me and Luca together. Without him, we would never have met. Luca and I now live in the cottage on Viola's property, overlooking the woodgrove, and are very happily married. I have spotted the Bigfoot fleetingly, on two separate occasions, one morning when washing dishes at the sink. So I know he's out there, watching over the woodgrove as some kind of guardian. As for Fee's little dog, Tubbs, nothing has changed in that regard. Even falling down the ditch and taking a sprain to his back leg has done nothing to sever his interest in chasing rabbits. Fee McGregor is now engaged to a lovely young man and no longer regrets her breakup from Jason. In fact, she's very glad about it. So there you are. That's my story. Wow, what can I say? That is an incredible story. Until next time, goodbye and good night.